So now we'll talk about section 1.8, emphasis and focal point. So emphasis is the principle by which an artist draws attention to particular parts or a particular part of a work. Um, now the opposite of emphasis is subordination. Um, so certain areas of a composition can be purposefully made less visually interesting so that the areas of emphasis stand out or so that attention goes elsewhere. An artist can emphasize a small area, a broad area, or multiple areas in a work, or they can simply emphasize the entire work. Um, focal point is a clearly defined, relatively small place of specific interest within a work to which the artist draws the eye. Um, the focal point serves to concentrate our attention on certain symbols, actions, or points. Um, emphasis can be created with line, implied line, contrast, color, and other elements. We've looked at this specific work a couple times now, um, but Artemisia Gentileschi's Judith Decapitating Califernes um, is a great example of how an artist can use various elements to create visual emphasis. Um, so Gentileschi is utilizing these contrasting values, um, this sort of dark background against the contrast of the kind of bright light that serves as a spotlight um, to emphasize the arms and action. And then she also uses directional line that allows us to follow um, along the arms and other limbs, <clears throat> excuse me, in the image towards the focal point on the victim's head um, or on the flirting blood, the kind of violent action of the story here. Here we have a work by the artist Ando Hiroshiji. Um, this is the Riverside Bamboo Market from 1857. Um, so where's the focal point here? There are actually multiple focal points. Um, none of them really demand more attention than the other. So we have three, the moon, the bridge, and the boat. Each of these sort of um, commands attention on its own. The bridge is the largest shape, so it naturally grabs us. Um, and then the contrasting values and sharp shape pull us up towards the moon, um, while the careful placement of the figure under the bridge within the boat um, is visually interesting. So again, it sort of grabs our attention with this definite outline that contrasts with the flat, light-colored water. Um, so the placement of these three focal points um, with varying distances between um, sort of creates this sense of rhythm that leads to, <clears throat> excuse me, that actually leads the viewer's eye around. We've looked at this work as well. Um, this is Francisco Goya's The Third of May, 1808. Um, Goya is utilizing the bright white and yellow um, that contrast with these dark values around it. Um, as well as directional line um, to create a clear focal point. Um, he uses psychological forces that direct both our attention and our sympathy um, throughout this composition. Um, so we've spoken previously about how the soldiers are faceless and therefore dehumanized while the dead and dying are full of expression. Um, they're each having individual experiences and then the central figure in the yellow and white um, is making this gesture with his arms raised that's sort of reminiscent of Christ on the cross during the crucifixion. Um, so likening this victim to a martyr. Um, so pulling at the viewer's emotions and again, grabbing our attention. Um, now we also have the lines of the guns um, that sort of point to him and direct the viewer's eye um, towards that central focal point. Um, you could also consider the line of the hill that moves our eye sort of down and backward along that different value contrast towards the town in the background. Um, we could potentially consider the background here as an area of subordination. Um, the dark value um, of the sky doesn't contrast very much with the kind of muted colors used in the, the town, um, though it's not especially um, subordinated, but it doesn't stand out a lot and it doesn't distract from um, the main scene here. 
Another great example, this is Georges Latour's Joseph the Carpenter. Um, here we have a very private scene of a young boy, Jesus, um, with his stepfather, Joseph. Um, so light can function like a spotlight um, to direct our gaze to a particular place within the frame, as we saw with Genelesky's, um work, right? Um, and so that's happening here in Latour's Joseph as well. Um, Latour is using tenebrism or that sort of specific um, type of chiaroscuro um, with the high contrasting lights and darks increasing the drama of the scene. Um, the title of this work, Joseph the Carpenter, suggests that um, Joseph is the main subject, but when looking at the composition, it is actually the young Christ's face um, that is the most noticeable. Um, it's being cast in almost this divine light from the candle in front of him. Um, and while Joseph's physical attention is down here, sort of on his work, um, his eyes actually glance up at Jesus' face. Um, and so we also have this contrast between the age and experience of Joseph and the youth and sort of innocence of Christ here. Um, this is potentially um, a bit of foreshadowing. Um, Joseph is using a tool called an auger to drill out a hole in this block of wood. Um, and notice the auger forms this sort of T or cross shape um, as it is drilled into the wood here. So perhaps this is meant to um, meant to illustrate a moment of realization for Joseph um, as he sort of sees what will be happening to his um, to his son here. Um, so here we have a work um, by Diego Velasquez. This is his Las Meninas from about 1656. Um, now this is a huge painting, quite like the one that he has depicted um, in the painting itself. Um, he's included a portrait, a self-portrait rather, of himself holding a palette and paintbrush, working on this very large scale canvas um, of a scale similar to Las Meninas. So potentially he was indicating that he was busy working on this. Um, anyway. There are several focal points within this large composition. So Velázquez was the first painter to a powerful Spanish king, which was a very prestigious position. Potentially, that's part of why he included his self-portrait here, to suggest that he was working on um, this large-scale painting for a prestigious patron. So what is the focal point here? Well, as I mentioned, there are several. Um, one is about here. Um, so here we have the princess or the infanta, Margarita, and she's shown here with her maids of honor. Um, she's kind of given this centralized placement and portrayed in light values. So she's sort of spotlighted, um, whereas Velasquez's own portrait is more subordinated, um, shown in darker colors and lower values kind of in shadow. He's there and he's a part of the scene, but he's not the main focus. Um, we also have this interesting sort of implied line created by the figures or the dresses of the figures um, that sort of moves throughout the middle of them and pulls, um, pulls the viewer's eye across the composition, right? Now, we also have another focal point, sort of just above and behind the princess. Um, we have this figure framed by an open door. So he's sort of um, silhouetted, his dark figure and cloak are silhouetted against the light, um, light value background. So creating this contrast that kind of grabs our attention. Um, it really frames and emphasizes this figure um, who is the queen's attendant, um, whose name was Nieto. Um, but again, he's sort of subordinated. He's smaller in scale than the princess, further away, um, kind of surrounded by all of this dark value, shadowy area. Um, so he's again, not our main focus. Now to the left of Nieto, 
we have um, another focal point. Um, here we have a mirror, excuse me. Um, it's sort of lighter in value than the surrounding area. Um, and it's more reflective than the other paintings that are on the wall. Um, so we have this dark frame around the mirror, um, but within the reflection itself, we have this sort of flash of red, maybe curtains um, that are reflecting um, to sort of grab our attention. And then if we get a little closer, we can see that this mirror is actually reflecting the king and queen of Spain, um, King Philip IV and Mariana of Austria. Um, so perhaps this mirror is meant to be reflecting um, the painting that Velazquez is working on in this scene. Um, perhaps the king and queen are present in the room, um, but not in this particular composition, um, as if they were sort of watching over the princess or um, posing to have their portrait painted by Velazquez. Um, or perhaps this reflection is meant to be us, uh, the viewer, sort of standing in place of the king and queen. Um, it's sort of ambiguous. Um, now the king and queen are really greater in significance than these other figures, so they would naturally demand more of our attention. But Velazquez has subordinated their image here by painting them in a smaller scale, um, and also by depicting them through their secondary sort of reflected image instead of the real thing, like he's depicted the princess. Um, so this composition, again, has multiple focal points, but some are more emphasized while others are more subordinated. Um, he maintains formal portraits for the king and queen, um, but the rest of the scene reads more like a genre painting or um, sort of an image of everyday life. It is a portrait, yes, um, but a more intimate one. Here's an example from your book. This is Marc Chagall's The Fall of Icarus from 1975. Um, so here Chagall has illustrated a story from Greek mythology. Um, Gagelus was a great sculptor and inventor from Athens, um, and he helped King Minos of Crete by designing a labyrinth to contain the Minotaur. Um, after he designed the labyrinth, the king didn't uh, want to let the valuable inventor leave, um, so he imprisoned him and his son Icarus um, in the labyrinth, I think. Anyway, to escape, Daedalus built two sets of wings using feathers and wax. Um, he warned his son Icarus, Take the middle way in case the moisture weighs down your wings if you fly too low or if you go too high and the sun scorches them. Travel between the extremes. Um, so they take off and for a while it goes fine, but after a time Icarus gets arrogant and he flies higher and higher until he becomes so close to the sun that his wax wings begin to melt. So Chagall has illustrated this sort of critical moment in the story, really drawing attention to and emphasizing um, a particular moment in a sequence of moments. Um, the focal point here is Icarus. Um, he's larger in scale than these figures who are below him. Um, and he's position, positioned, excuse me, at the top sort of center of the picture plane. Um, he's also set apart from the light sky by the bold primary colors and his brightly colored wings, um, which contrast to the dull pale gray color of the sky. Um, so this really emphasizes the flailing figure um, that Chagall has depicted with these sort of energetic brush strokes. Now, in contrast to Chagall's Icarus, we have Peter Brugel the Elder's Landscape with the Fall of Icarus from about 1555 to 1558, um, which this one is in your book as well. And as indicated by the title, we're dealing with the same subject matter, but unlike Chagall, Brugel has deliberately diverted attention. Um, we barely notice Icarus as he sort of plunges into the sea. Um, is there a reason for this, do you think? Well, according to the original story, Icarus's father, Daedalus, didn't see Icarus fall. 
he only heard him scream and later found his body in the sea. Um, so perhaps that was Brugal's inspiration here. Um, what's the focal point of this composition? Not Icarus, that's for sure. Um, really, the focal point is here in the foreground. Um, we have this bright red sleeve of the plowman that kind of draws our attention um, because of the contrasting colors. But the plowman is really just going about his day, totally unaware of Icarus. Um, to his left, we have trees, um, sh ships, a sunset, all of these other things to catch our attention. Um, and then we barely notice Icarus's tiny legs um, as he falls into the sea, kind of hiding amongst these white caps and splashes and seabirds that sort of dot the composition. Um, some scholars think that Brugel was potentially illustrating a Flemish proverb um, in this scene. Um, and the proverb states, no plow stands still because a man dies, um, or in simpler terms, life goes on. Section 1.9 deals with pattern and rhythm. Um, and because 1.8 and 1.9 were both relatively short, I decided to put them together into one video here. Um, so pattern in art is the discernible regularity of design. Um, it's an arrangement of predictably repeated elements. Pattern can be used to create visual texture. Um, it can add visual interest, um, or it can be used to impose order on a work or create a sense of unity. Some patterns are more regular or more ordered than others. Rhythm is the regular or ordered repetition of elements within a work. Now, patterns do have rhythm, um, but we'll come back to the idea of rhythm momentarily. So looking at this pashmina carpet from northern India, um, we have this pattern of flower-like forms that are arranged and interlaced um, to give us a visual texture. This is sort of a branching pattern, so even though it repeats with regularity, there's also an intertwining of vines throughout, so finding um, any kind of beginning or end point would be quite difficult. Now, pattern is interesting because it simultaneously is unified while it provides variety as well. An isolated design repeated as a unit within a larger pattern is called a motif. Um, here we are looking at a hookah base or a hookah base, um, which is a water pipe. Um, this one comes from India from the 17th century. Um, here we have flowers and leaves of plants that recur at regular intervals around the surface. Um, and so this sort of, um, this sort of flower vine like arrangement would be our motif. Now motifs can represent certain ideas, images, themes, etc. And an artist can then create a sense of unity by using repeated motifs within a pattern. So if we return to this pashmina carpet, you can potentially isolate some of the motifs that are being repeated here. Although again, because this is a branching pattern, it is a little bit more difficult to isolate those. Here's another work that we've seen already, Gustav Klimt's Death and Life. Here, pattern is the systemic and repetitive use of the same motif or design. Um, so on the one side or on the right side, we have kind of various patterns, um, though they're all unified in sort of color as well as shape and size, but they are brightly colored, kind of evocative of growth and life. Um, whereas on the left, we have more of a repeated motif of this cross um, that creates our pattern using these darker, uh, more somber tones and values. A motif can also be a distinctive visual element or symbol that is repeated across multiple works. For example, a skull motif is a symbol that is associated with death. We often see it on tombstones, um, or we might see a skull and a crossbones um, as sort of a warning. Um, memento mori is a Latin phrase that means remember that you have to die. 
um, and that is a type of this motif. Um, it serves as a reminder of the inevitability of death um, and the shortness or fragility of life. Sometimes we might also see the hourglass motif as a symbol of the brevity of life, or we might see um, death or a grim reaper carrying a scythe as a symbol of justice and of death. Um, now, no matter how you lived your life, it will end in death, right? Um, so in the 17th century, in the 16th and 17th century, really, um, amongst Dutch golden age artists in the Netherlands, um, this idea of vanitas um, was popularized. So vanitas is closely related to the memento mori. It sort of symbolizes mortality as well as other things. Um, typically, they featured skulls, um, again, as a symbol of sort of the inevitability of death and the mortality of humanity. Um, but other symbols like musical instruments, wine, books, etc., were also present to remind of the vanity or worthlessness of worldly pleasures and goods. Patterns can make things more pleasing to look at, but they can also obscure things in some ways. Um, so here we have a cross page from the Lindisfarne Gospels, which is an illuminated manuscript um, from about 700 CE. Um, so this is a cross, but it's not incredibly obvious. Um, this page is very representative of how Christian imagery and pre-Christian pagan motifs came together in the early Christian era of the British Isles. Um, so the cross is a Christian symbol, but it's bordered on this page by pagan style animals and these kind of fighting beasts with spiral tails. Um, so by combining these um, motifs from both belief systems, um, people who were converting or who would soon convert from paganism to Christianity um, could feel more seen or perhaps find the works more recognizable or interesting. Um, in a sense, the artist is attempting to include something for everyone here kind of ease the pagans into the idea of Christianity by including familiar motifs. So in Islamic art and architecture, pattern often plays an important role um, and it's often quite meaningful. So here we are looking at an iwan, which is a niched entrance portal of a mosque. Um, this is the um, Grand Mosque of Isfahan in Iran, and it was constructed in the early 17th century. Um, so here inside this Iwan, this entrance portal, we have uh, various patterns that create lots of visual texture in entrance. We have this sort of grand framing of the door within the niche and the arch itself. Um, we have the sort of tiled patterns uh, geometric and kind of organically inspired patterns on the walls. But then as we move up into the arch itself, we also have these repeated sort of three-dimensional geometric shapes. Um, these are called mukarnas. Um, they are a form of architectural ornamentation and sort of vaulting. Um, essentially, they consist of geometric subdivisions of corbels or squinches, which we'll get into those architectural terms a bit later in the term in the semester um but essentially these are sort of concave geometric forms that stack together um, these are sometimes called honeycomb vaults because the individual um concave forms fit together like a honeycomb so what do these do visually well, when we look upwards into that arch, um, the Mukarnas sort of create this rhythmic, almost mystical or otherworldly um, dematerialization effect. Um, it's almost as if as the arch rises towards the heavens, it starts to dematerialize or um, become ethereal, um, kind of associating it with the divine. There is also plenty of patterning inside this mosque in Isfahan. So Islamic religion forbids the figural representation of God or of Allah. 
um, as well as of Muhammad and other prophets. So instead, artists, um, artists seek to achieve spirituality through the use of pattern. Um, they use geometric, calligraphic, and vegetal patterning to create a sense of this sort of heavenly space um, within the mosque or within the place of worship um, that is evocative of the infinite nature of Allah. Um, so really, these patterns become a form of meditation. They're meant to sort of encourage contemplation through the um, focus on their abstract designs instead of any sort of figural representation. Here we have another example of those mukarnas. So this one in the hall of Avin Sarahis. Um, quite intricate, kind of spectacularly carved um, stucco mukarnas in this star-shaped dome. Um, these are really great for acoustics as well. Um, the corners here are supported by squinches and ball projections that are also filled with more mukarnas. Um, and it really creates this kind of dematerializing architectural space. So rhythm is based on repetition, and it's a basic part of our existence. We have the rhythm of the seasons, the cycles of the moon, rhythms of the wave on the shoreline. Um, these all serve to mark the passage of time. Um, music and dance also mark rhythm in a similar way. Visual rhythm really deals with the arrangement of elements so that they move the viewer through a piece. In the visual arts, rhythm is active. It pulls the viewer along and really makes us feel a certain way. Um, so here, sticking with Islamic architecture, we're looking at the Great Mosque of Cordoba in Cordoba, Spain. Um, and we are specifically looking at um, one of the prayer halls here. And so within this prayer hall, repetition creates a beautiful sense of rhythm. Um, we have these seemingly endless rows of identical columns and arches. Um, that have alternating red and white voussoirs, or these um, sort of tr upside down trapezoidal shaped stones. Um, now, these are also alternating in materials. The white is um, a sort of white stone, while the red are made of brick. So we have not only a visual, a visual rhythm, excuse me, but the alternation of material also adds um, to the strength and stability of the arches. But each element, the columns, the arches, um, the individual voussoirs themselves, these all have their own simple rhythms that enhance the function of the space um, and really become part of the worship. Um, the rhythm here pulls you into a spiritual state and really creates a space for prayer and contemplation. And here we have Maya Lin's wave field from 2009. Um, and in this work, the element of mass really demonstrates the principle of rhythm. Um, so these waveforms are built into the earth and repeated again and again, kind of evoking feelings of water, but translated into this grass covered turf, right? Um, now this is a pretty large work. It's arranged in seven rows that spread over 11 acres. Um, and they range in height from about 12 to 18 feet. Um, so we can see the rhythm by looking um, at this work from afar here, but um, we could also experience the rhythm by walking along these kind of grassy waveforms. Um, so visual rhythm, but also a rhythmic experience as well. Rhythm does not have to be steady though. For example, here we have Rosa Bonner's Plowing in the Nivernais from 1849. Um, so this work addresses um, changing rhythms to communicate animal biorhythms as they move in concert with their surroundings. Um, so we have this horizontal composition that's really sort of enhanced by the rhythm that leads our eye from left to right, sort of from one group of shapes to the next. So by changing the width of gaps between the animals, the artist creates a sense of this irregular sort of plodding movement. Each group of animals is different in relative size and takes up a different amount of space within the composition, which also creates another visual rhythm that pulls the eye across the composition. The cows and colors that punctuate this field 
are also arranged in sort of a rhythmic way. Um, we have this sense of weightiness, um, of wading through this soil, um, of pulling a heavy plow perhaps, but there's also an air of respectability or nobility here. Um, the artist seems to be honoring the reality of these hardworking laborers, um, both the humans and the animals, um, by reminding the viewer of this sort of slow, irregular physical rhythm, the weight and the brute strength that are being um, displayed here. Um, so here we are seeing a bai or a men's meeting house. Um, this is from the island of Palau in the Pacific Ocean. Um, this particular one is the Bai Ra Irai, or the men's meeting house of Irai, which is a city or a town um, on the island of Palau. So these meeting houses, um, the facades are typically decorated with regular rhythmic patterns. Um, so here we have repeated fish motifs that create a pattern. Um, however, each register is different. As the images become increasingly irregular and change shape, um, they sort of rise towards the roof. Um, so we have this alternating rhythm that adds variety, visual interest, excitement, and sort of a level of unpredictability to the design. Um, and then you might also notice along the edges of the roof, we have this more regular series of symbols that when combined with the horizontal beams uh, sort of frames the composition or frames the facade and adds a dynamic feeling. Our last example for this discussion is going to be Brugel's Hunters in the Snow from 1565. So there are large rhythmic progressions that move the eye all around the canvas here. But there are also smaller, more refined rhythms created through the repetition of details. Um, so we have a variety of rhythm here. Beginning on the left side of the composition, we have a group of hunters. Um, they're sort of dark in contrast against the white snow. Um, and they trudge over this hill, uh, seemingly just returned from a not so successful hunt. It's a bit hard to notice, but there's really only one maybe two foxes or rabbits, perhaps, um, slung over the shoulder of this one hunter. So they weren't very successful on this trip. Um, their shoulders are sort of hunched and the canines that are with them are all sort of holding their heads downward. So the, the tone or the mood being expressed here is quite solemn, perhaps a little melancholy. But our eye sort of follows their movement, um, as well as the rhythmic line of trees here that kind of pulls us down the hill and backward into the compositional space. We move from the foreground to the midground, and really this continues kind of in a smaller scale um, through the midground all the way to the background where we reach these mountains. Now, the figures are irregular in rhythm, while the trees are more regular, though they still change shape a little from tree to tree. Um, once we reach the midground, the eye sort of falls onto the figures on this large frozen pond, which is sort of similar in color um, to the sky above. Um, and then we can sort of follow the ridge line of the mountains and the sky back over to the left side of the composition, up this sort of hill and along this row of repeated houses, um, back up to inspect this smaller group um, of people who are working around the fire, kind of roasting um, something on a spit here. Um, and then eventually leading back to this kind of main figural group here. Um, so we have all of these smaller rhythms that work together in this composition um, to create an overall sense of rhythm or an overall compositional rhythm.